I'd, uh, I didn't even know I was supposed to make an appearance here except uh, <coughs> someone told me to go to the home builder's hangar and this is a NASA tent, isn't it? <laughs> Good lens. You mean NASA? Um, you mean EAA is more important than NASA now? How the heck did that happen? You know, this is the most phenomenal place. I've been told there's five percent of the America's airplanes show up at this airport this week. Isn't that cool? I mean, that <laughs> and something like three percent of the world's airplanes are here this week. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, apologize to you guys by not bringing my new airplane here. I, I didn't know that I'd build a new airplane in retirement, but I, after sitting around long enough and looking at all those neat little float planes that fly over my house and land on the lake in front of me, uh, I decided to go ahead and do something. And uh, uh, tomorrow at one o'clock in Forum 7, I'm going to go ahead and, and unveil that airplane even though it's not here. Uh, it's something I, I don't like to do. I wanted you to see it fly in nonstop from home. Uh, but the bottom line is we, when I say we, uh, is Dan Woodward here? I, I believe Brent Reagan is here too. Brent? You know, I think they're over at the Starship probably. <clears throat> I had a couple of guys working with me uh, full time. What I mean by full time is 18 hours a day. <laughs> and uh, I'm working in my garage. Now, in the 60s, 1968, I started building my very vegan in my garage. Okay. It took me four years to build. And I flew it here to Oshkosh in 72. Uh, uh, and um, I had actually attended Oshkosh in 71, so I believe this is either my 40th or 41st time to be at Oshkosh during, during the show. And, <laughs> but anyway, uh, the ski goal, uh, you've read a few things about it. I wanted to keep it covert, but uh, I decided to help uh, the Black Sky uh, film people. And when I say Black Sky, how many here have seen Black Sky, the documentary on our Spaceship One? If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube now, go look at it, it's really some good work. Uh, because it's such fabulous work, I invited these guys in to cover us building the ski goal. And they show up at my house, at my garage, about every, uh, every couple of months and do a lot of filming. They put a camera up for time lapse that takes a picture every five minutes for seven months. <laughs> uh, I hate to tell you guys, but there's some pictures on there where I'm not wearing any clothes. <laughs> but anyway, they're, they're, they're gathering. In fact, they're over here. Let me introduce uh, Scott B. and Sandy. He's the guy holding up that camera. Uh, uh, I, I did allow them to leak a little bit of information about, about Ski Goal in order to help them uh, uh, raise money on their Kickstarter program, and which was very successful. I think they raised more than twice their goal on Kickstarter, uh, which is allowing them to, to fund this film that they're going to do. And I'm really looking forward to that, because it's, it's, if it's going to be the same kind of quality as Black Sky, it's going to be really something. And I think they have a little uh, forum on it on Friday uh, in Forum 9. What time? 11? One o'clock, yeah, so I'll be there for that too. But anyway, let me get back to what we've been doing over the last few months. About January, I decided that I can indeed get this airplane to Oshkosh uh, if, I, if I have some help. So Dan Woodward, who, who built all my furniture for my retirement home, he's an artisan and he works real fast. Uh, he jumped in and helped me. And Brent Reagan, uh, who's, who's uh, probably the smartest guy I know, you'll, you'll meet him tomorrow at, at the end of the, uh, uh, of the talk. He'll, he'll describe his work to develop the docking system for Skigol. 
which is, uh, Skigo is a hybrid airplane. It uses electric propulsion to, to help it come up to a dock and you let it back up or turn around. That, that propulsion system also gives you an extra 20% or more thrust for takeoff if you're at a high altitude lake and you're heavy. It also is a cool thing because your docking system, if you lose an engine on takeoff climbing over the trees, you turn on your docking motors and you can climb up to downwind and land into the wind on the lake you just took off even though your engine threw a rod. And that's kind of cool. So, so uh, it's just one of the features. And you're going to learn all about uh, Ski Goal if you come tomorrow at 1 because I'm going to show the whole evolution of how I got there and how I ended up deciding to make an airplane with do a lot more than I originally planned because I knew it would be my last airplane. And the reason I knew it would be my last airplane is working 16 to 18 hours a day in my garage, sanding and breathing carbon fiber dust and getting sticky <laughs> and doing layups and calling in some volunteers to help me do big layups. Uh, this airplane has a phenomenally new approach for composite construction, something, that, something that's totally different than what you've seen on any of my airplanes, and I, it's totally different than any other airplane on the, on the field in terms of its structure. And I'm going to reveal, unveil that and show you the details on that tomorrow. Uh, that was hard work for a guy that's 72. <laughs> and I found that my... My, my legs and knees were getting double size and I was having cramps and I couldn't sleep. But we kept on driving and driving. We can make Oshkosh, we can make Oshkosh. <laughs> and finally on the 30th, which is, what, three weeks ago? We finally had it down at the weight and balance. Totally assembled airplane, getting ready for the FAA inspection. And we put it down on the skis and I realized right then we're not going to Oshkosh because I made a mistake. Uh, these big skis are real flexible and they have little wheels on them that hang down just that much from the bottom. They're four inch, the main wheels on the ski go are four inch diameter. And they hang down just an inch below the ski so they, so they let you have a good water ski or a snow ski for takeoff and landing. That allows you to land on runways because on the back of the skis are some little rower blade wheels that let you roll on. And now when you're on a runway and you've got the weight, weight off the wings, you're on a main gear that's in a normal position for a main gear for a tail dragger. And your tail wheel is on the ground and you've got a steerable tail wheel. So now you're a conventional tail dragger airplane, which means I could land here at Oshkosh and taxi up to the show center and tie it down. Well, what happened, the stiffness of a carbon fiber beam is a cube function of how thick it is. So if you make a little mistake, which I did, in the thickness of the ski, it doesn't flex as much. And when I put the airplane down on the ground on the 30th of June, <laughs> uh, it sat on the uh, on the main wheels and on the on the on the ski trailing edge wheels, and the tail wheel was that far off the ground. And I said, "Wait a minute, <laughs> I won't be able to go to an airport." Now it doesn't it wouldn't affect the initial flight test because all of my flight tests initially are going to be off of water, okay, off of the lake, Lake Coeur d'Alene. And and I'm thinking, you know, I can't bring an airplane to Oshkosh that can only land on water. <laughs> It was also becoming uh, obvious that, uh, you know, I would need probably another week to, to fix these skis and whatever. I, we just didn't have the time. I also had an FAA guy who said, gee, I was going to come on Monday to, to do your inspection, but my doctor says that after my nose surgery, uh, I shouldn't be lifting things or bending over. I swear to God, that's what he said. Now, you know, I, I don't want to blame the FAA, but he said he couldn't do the inspection. I don't want to blame the FAA because as a result, it, it, they, they were not the reason that I couldn't get it here. The reason that I couldn't get it here is that we just flat were running out of time to do flight tests 
And on top of that, I realized that I was gonna spend another week fixing these skis so I could go into runways. So we gave up. And on the 1st of July, both Dan Woodward and I just flat collapsed. We realized that we had been running on nothing but adrenaline because we had no energy left and we slept all day. And uh, you know, Dan uh, was advised to go into the hospital with pneumonia and he said, no, I'm gonna keep working on this airplane. So we, I had what amounted to a torture chamber going on in my garage, <laughs> uh, literally a torture chamber. I couldn't quit because these other guys were, were hammering away. Trevor, who teaches composites at the local college, he'd come in after four o'clock when he was done teaching school, and he'd come in and work till 10, 11 o'clock at night doing the cowlings and the tooling and the nacelle. And uh, so, you know, even though I was really, really tired and, and questioning whether I'm gonna have enough time to do flight tests, I just flat, uh, uh, couldn't quit because I had other guys really working. So anyway, Dan and I collapsed. We had the airplane at, at Brent Reagan's shop because um, he does, he did the wiring, the electronics, the avionics. He did the plumbing for the fuel system. He did the plumbing for the pneumatic system, which puts the airplane up on skis. It's a pneumatically deployed ski. And uh, he, he also did the full Rotex uh, installation. He built the engine mount for it. And, and there's a lot of real clever stuff, and you'll see it tomorrow. But anyway, he did all that work, but he kept working. <laughs> and I would, I would go back to his shop, and he's in there, bent over the airplane, still working long hours. And sure enough, he got everything done that was on his list, and he ran the engine. Uh, just on the day that I th thought I needed to in order to start our flight test in order to get to Oshkosh. And then he said, well, you might as well take it home. <laughs> and we did. So we took the airplane back to my garage and, and it's frankly been sitting there. I've done very little work on it since. I says, I'm not gonna work on it till after Oshkosh because we were really, we were really damn near killing ourselves trying to get it to the show. So uh, I really tried hard, but uh, I don't know where I'm going to publicly unveil it. It'll probably be at one of the seaplane fly-ins that we have four or five times a year up in the, in the Northwest. But I'll certainly have it at Oshkosh next year, if it flies okay. <laughs> I remember this a caveat. Uh, when you guys saw, how, ma how many were here 40 years ago and saw the Very Easy come over? Wow, cool. <laughs> okay, uh, tonight at eight o'clock, I've got a, a talk uh, my brother was flying it when it came over 40 years ago. He'll be on the stage with me. Mike Melville also will be on the stage, who was a key guy working at uh, Mike and Sally at, at RAF when we were doing the home builds. And I've got a, a bunch of slides, uh, some of them really kind of fun. I'm gonna show tonight a couple of slides that were, that were, uh, I don't wanna use the word classified, but they were, they were covert and not shown and you'll see why, uh, but I'm gonna show them tonight. You know, when you get over 70, you don't give a shit anymore. <laughs> and uh, we, <laughs> in fact, we, our mascot around our place is a honey badger. You guys, you guys know the honey badger. You, you don't give a shit. <laughs> you know, but, uh, so I'm gonna have a hell of a lot of fun here at Oshkosh and it's been, it's been wonderful to, uh, to fly here relaxed in, in the back of the Starship instead of sit for eight and a half hours in a ski gull <laughs> and then have a new airplane here. Um, I've got 12 different appearances. This is the first of 12 between now and Friday. So uh, um, I, if I had the airplane on top of that, it would, I, would, I would probably work myself to a frazzle again. So I, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. Okay. There's a very easy that's been flying for, can't be 50 years. Uh, <laughs> the oldest very easy that flew was 40 years ago. Then let's go take the owner of the court. <laughs> well, no, no, I mean, uh, uh, 1975 was the first flight of the, of the, by the way, there were three very easies. You'll see that tonight in the presentation at, at uh, 
at Theater in the Woods. By the way, I don't have any idea on what the re issues on, or excuse me, what the schedule or anything on this particular uh, event. How, how long am I supposed to talk? Four hours. you want. Okay. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I wanted you to know the story of how hard we tried to get Ski Goal here. So I started with that. I started with that. But I'm going to do mostly Q&A here because I, I want to be I want to be addressing the stuff that you guys are interested in. Uh, so let me give just a little more summary. Uh, also, uh, I'm going to do a talk on space. Is there any NASA people here or historians about space? Is there anybody here that remembers what happened in the 1960s? You do? Okay. I'm going to challenge you. I'm not going to tell you because I don't want you to Google it in the middle time. But I'm going to ask you some questions to see how smart you are on what happened in the 60s. Okay? And that's going to be really interesting. So I'm going to talk about space history. And you can't talk about space history without talking about NASA. And I am going to talk about the absolutely phenomenal, unbelievable things that NASA did in the 60s. The second subject on this talk, which is at 1 o'clock in Forum 7 on Thursday, is going to be about something else I did since I retired. I didn't intend to do it, but I'll tell you why I got locked into it. But I stumbled into something new, which I believe is one of the biggest breakthroughs in orbital space launch ever. And I have not, I have it patented, and I have never presented it to an audience. So Thursday, I'm going to unveil my new patent for uh, orbital space launch. You guys probably thought I didn't do anything after Spaceship One. <laughs> um, but um, th I'm really excited about this because it's a significant, it's a significant uh, invention. So I'll talk about that. And another thing I'm going to talk about is, the third thing I'm going to talk about is about my friend Elon Musk. I am absolutely appreciative of what Elon did with his own money and what he's doing to save us from total embarrassment of not being able to put anybody in space, us being Americans. Elon Musk is a foreigner, he's a South African. And he came to this country to help make America look exceptional. And I applaud him for that, I really do. But the reason that I'm gonna talk about him is I'm going to tell him that his, that his design to reuse a booster by putting a landing gear on it and have it light its rocket motors and land on a barge is wrong. So I'm going to show you something that, that we actually tested in model size and designed about 22 years ago at Scale Composites. And I'm going to compare that, that method with what Elon is trying to do to, to land his, his boosters on the barge. And that'll be kind of fun. So three subjects, one o'clock, Thursday, Forum 7. Uh, and I also have a forum on a new company called Rutan RC. Now that used to be called, that used to be called, Ru Jeff, hey, you made it. Jeff Corsigna is the principal in Rutan RC. Now, it, and, and Dan Craig, yeah, step, step forward, Dan. Okay, Dan worked for me for decades at Scaled, and he's the best structural analyst I've ever had. These two guys, and me, although they're doing all the work, are forming a new company. Um, uh, Jeff uh, Corsigna used to work for Mattel, and then Air Hogs, and he was a chief designer of, of radio control model airplane. Some of them just toys, but some of them real cool breakthroughs in radio control model airplanes. Dan is an expert radio control modeler, and for decades he has been marketing something called I, IFO. 
And if you're an RC guy, you've probably flown an IFO. But anyway, us three together are forming a company that was called Rutan Model Aircraft Factory. And somebody figured out, oh, that's a hokey name, so now it's called Rutan RC. But what it is, to start off, this company is going to offer uh, almost ready to fly models that are priced somewhere between the toys that you buy at Christmas and the and the serious RC modeler airplanes. It's kind of we're kind of shooting for that middle ground, and we're going to be selling model airplanes of hopefully at some point all of my 47 different full-scale airplanes. Okay. Dan, Dan, come up here because I want you to, I don't know the schedule. Dan is going to be flying one or two of these out at Pioneer Field uh, sometime this week and I'm not sure when it is. I'm going to, the first couple ones that, that will be marketed are the Long Easy and then a Spaceship 2, a Spaceship 1. And what we're going to do there is you'll buy a model airplane which is really two models, a White Knight 1 and a Spaceship 1. And the Spaceship One is the one that has the power. So it powers it up, and then it drops off. And the Spaceship One can do all kinds of aerobatics and whatever, but it can also go straight up and then go into feather and fall like a Spaceship One for re-entry. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and then come out of feather and then come up and land at your feet. That's a neat model airplane. And uh, Dan has, has uh, engineered that, developed it, and flying it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it and tell us when you're going to fly it at the show, because I, I don't know. I'm not sure either when, when we're going to fly, but there's windows uh, every evening from 7 to 10 where they're, they're allowed to fly uh, RC models by the, uh, by the uh, uh, museum. So 7 to 10 every evening. They're Pioneer Airfield. So, yeah, 7 to 10 every evening uh, by the... Pioneer Airfield by the uh, museum. They're being allowed. I think it's the first time ever, ever they're letting our guys fly RC models. Um, I'm not sure exactly when we'll be demonstrating. Probably, definitely uh, seven o'clock Thursday, between seven and ten on Thursday. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe tonight. I don't know. But you got your eight o'clock talk too. So. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I should have had Jeff come up too. But I, I wanted to introduce you to these, to all of these guys. They've been working really, really hard to put together this, this, uh, this new product. Uh, and I gotta admit that I've done almost nothing the last six months because all I was doing is trying to get the ski goal to Oshkosh. So I haven't been very helpful to them lately. But uh, Jeff, you wanna talk a little bit about what, what the company's gonna do? I'd like to find out. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're all wondering at, at this point. Um, the first step, of course, was to develop the the initial aircraft, and uh, uh, Dan, Dan's a master model builder, and uh, uh, he's done an amazing job. Uh, the the aircraft have been developed. The long, long easy uh, RC long easy is finished, flight tested. Um, uh, full CAD's been done for production engineering. Uh, we have our package ready for manufacture, and uh, we're currently uh, shopping for factories and. Uh, um, uh, looking for manufacturing financial partners and just a tremendous amount of work to get the company going. Uh, if you if you ever want to manufacture anything in volume, uh, it's a huge job. And uh, but it's a whole lot of fun. Um, there there are great challenges doing Bert's airplanes at model scale, and uh, uh, we're trying to we're trying to keep the the novel features. In each airplane, each airplane is so special. It's, 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 you know, it's uh, all. It, each one has been built, designed to a purpose, and we want to be sure that that purpose is demonstrated in the models. And uh, I think uh, Spaceship One uh, White Knight combo. I, I think we've, we've we've nailed it. Dan, Dan's got a great model, and and the Long Easy as well. Uh, 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 long, long Easy is a big challenge with the canard at that small scale, and. Uh, uh, we've done something clever, we think, with it, and it flies great. Yeah, they're all electric, you know, so far. Yep. Now, uh, I'm going to make sure 
that Rutan RC is not only old RAF airplanes or old RAF or scaled airplanes. Um, I've been working with Dan on a couple of new ideas which are new kind of stuff for radio control and they're in a research mode now. And uh, one of them involves your ability to fly indoors, a radio control model that only can be flown outdoors. Okay, and it's easier to fly, easier to hover, and it's good for beginners. And if you're up in a in the winter and it's blowing like crazy outside and you can't fly, you can actually fly indoors. So it, it's something that, that we're calling tethered RC. And, and I've, I've done some research on it. I have built a, a bar table in my house that's also a runway for horizontal and vertical landing. <laughs> and off to the side, I can do a combat with two different models from floor to ceiling. And it's really exciting, it's cool. In fact, it makes RC easy enough to fly that even my thumbs could do it. So that's one thing we're kind of excited about, and, and I don't know when we'll introduce that, but when we get, when we get, it, get to it, we will. And there's something else, and I'm not gonna tell you what it was, because I, what it is, because I don't want competitors beating us to it while we're doing the long easy on the Spaceship One, but it's very exciting. And it'll involve some, some new ways to do competitive radio control modeling and uh, that's all I'm going to say about it, but it's in, it's in research now, and we're real excited about it. So, Rutan RC is not going to be just building things from Starship to Spaceship 2, you know, it's, it's going to be uh, all those 47 airplanes. It's, it's going to be also uh, offering and introducing uh, some, some really unique new ideas that we hope will bring a lot more kids into radio control. And we also need that to happen because we have a dwindling pilot uh, population and we need to bring people in uh, to fly airplanes. Uh, by the way, my wife, uh, knowing that I was out there working very hard in the garage, well, she's helping too. I'll show you her helping me build that first part. Uh, she went out and got a seaplane rating. So she is a seaplane private pilot now. Tanya. Now, let me ask, how many in, in this audience are, have single engine C on their private license? Okay. By the way, I'm, I am going to go to your corn roast uh, and give a little talk there. And I want to get acquainted with the seaplane people. Because uh, for most of my career, I've only met people that are, that are with the A plane or the B plane. And now I want to meet people from the seaplane the community. Uh, I, I, I live in seaplane heaven. Okay, now, let me ask another question. How many private pilots out there have single engine C on their license, but they are not licensed to fly a land plane? They're only seaplane private pilots. How many? <laughs> Tanya tells me there's only 35,000 seaplane pilots in the country. Is that really true? I don't know how many people are licensed like Tanya is, but she is a private pilot for seaplanes, and she has not yet taken her check ride for land planes. <laughs> she's got a lot of time. She's got, she's got something like uh, 180 hours or so. And she was a backseater rider in the Powder Puff Derby last year. You know what the Powder Puff Derby is? They call it something different now, Air Race Classic, where it's only women. You can't put a man in the airplane. This is a real sexist uh, thing. <laughs> Pam Bird, who's the wife of Forrest Bird, who has a wonderful museum up in Sandpoint, Idaho, uh, and Forrest Bird, by the way, has more flying time in helicopters than anybody in the world. He's, he's 94 years old now, I believe. Anyway, if you get a chance to go see his museum, it's really cool. Uh, she had a Cessna 182, and she brought along as her co-pilot, Tukey. And Tukey lives at, at uh, 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 what is it? Um, it's on the Colorado River uh, near Needles. Bullhead City, I think it is. She has a flying school, 
And Tukey is 80 years old, and she has 35,000 hours of flying. And she runs, she's still working, uh, doing flight instruction. She runs a flight school. So anyway, uh, Tanya's just a backseat rider to enjoy this. Uh, and they're on this race, which goes from uh, California all the way to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, something like that. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Pam, who owns the airplane, is tired. She says, I'm going to take airlines back. You guys fly home. So my wife, who's working on a private license, now gets, as a dual cross-country, she gets to fly coast to coast. Isn't that weird? You're, you're learning to fly, and you want to log your dual cross-country flying time, and you're flying coast to coast. And the interesting thing about it is getting the airplane back uh, to North Idaho for Pam, uh, uh, they got back a lot faster than they went the other way in the race. <laughs> so anyway, Tanya's having a lot of fun. Uh, she'll leave the house and say, I'm going to work. And what it is, she's going flying. So she has been having an awful lot of fun, mostly flying a seaplane that was built three years after I was born. It's a 1946 uh, PA-12S. Doesn't have wheels. And she is just having an absolute ball flying that. Uh, let's see. Bert, Bert, yeah, yeah. Uh, this come out there for you. Would you like to do uh, the, the remaining time answering people's questions? No, no. Uh, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I lived in the Mojave Desert for 46 years. <laughs> And for that entire time, for that entire time, I was always looking for shade. <laughs> and I'm enjoying being in here with you. I'll have plenty of time to talk around airplanes, but if I've got an audience like this, I'm not leaving. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's, that's kind of a... That's kind of a, um, a summary of, of the talks I'll be given. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, that's just the schedule. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, instead of rambling on, let me talk about things that you wanna hear. Uh, let's do try to focus, if we can, on the, on the 40th anniversary, uh, because uh, uh, a lot of things happened then, and I'm gonna show you some really cool pictures about what happened because the composite canard was introduced in 75. Uh, anyway, let me just take, take questions. I don't know if we have a mic out there. I'll, I'll try to repeat your answer. Yes, sir. What's that? Oh, yeah, okay. It is so great. It's so great to be back at Oscar. Yeah. Okay, right here. You hate it when I stopped the Canard Pusher newsletter. Give me, let me give you a little bit of statistics. Uh, I decided, you know, RAF did a couple of programs which were not related to home building. One of them was a NASA, a NASA program. We, we, we built, we designed and, and got that skew wing airplane. In fact, it made its, the AD-1, the skew wing, it made its last flight before it went to the museum right here in the Oshkosh uh, Air Show. And those of you that were here in the early 80s or so, that watched that thing come by and then skew its wings 60 degrees and make a pass, that airplane went on a truck and it's, it's in a museum in, in uh, Northern California now at the Hiller Museum, and it didn't fly after that. RAF also developed and tested a subscale version of the Fairchild Next Generation Trainer for the Air Force, okay? And I like to think we helped them win that competition. Now the competition didn't turn out too well for them, but we helped them win the contract, okay? And that was a fun thing to do. It took us seven months to build this airplane, seven weeks to do the flight test program. We handed in our test report so close to the time that they had to turn in their 
proposal to win that competition that they attached our test report unedited. <laughs> they only had one day. Unedited to their contract. So if you're, familiar, if you're not familiar with the uh, NGT, it used the same engines as the BD-5 jet. Uh, that was a neat program. But I realized then, in 1981 or so, that uh, I was probably going to be doing things that are plans built, kit airplanes for home builders, like most of the work I had done. Uh, you know, I did a, a new airplane every year at RAF. Uh, in fact, by the way, RAF built 15 airplanes and flew them. 15 in something like 13 years. We marketed only five of them. We sold plans for five of them. And for the life of me today, I look back at this as a business and realize how in the hell was I able to build 15 airplanes, including the Voyager. Remember the Voyager? Yeah. My brother and I are giving a talk on the Voyager. I think it's 10 o'clock on Friday, maybe Thursday. Look it up on the schedule. Uh, including the Voyager, we did 15 airplanes. The Grizzly is out here on the, on, I passed it walking up here, okay? We did 15 airplanes and our income to do that, our funding to do that, was selling plans for five home builds. Well, NASA paid us a little piddling amount of money to do the, you know how much I got from NASA to deliver a flight ready skew wing research airplane? including the, the full contract from Ames, who, who did the assembly of it. It's about $130,000. Those engines were leased to NASA, not they didn't own them. $130,000 on a fixed price contract, and I got audited. <laughs> that program would have made a profit, except I had to work with auditors from the government who were there to make damn sure that I wasn't gouging a fixed price contract. <laughs> I kid you not. And if you think that was bad in the 70s, <laughs> oh, I don't want to get into that. Let's take another question. Another question. Uh, in fact, I was told this morning by a NASA principal that if NASA tried to do what they did in the 60s, that almost every one of their procurement people would be in jail. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, uh, am I going to sell plans for the ski goal? Uh, you know, the, the basic bottom line is we got to see if it flies first. <laughs> I'm going to show you. Uh, and I, and I say on my first slide, this might all be bullshit. Uh, I don't, I, I've calculated the performance of the airplane. I have measured the hydrodynamic performance by building a full scale hydrodynamic test article that was pushed in front of Joe's boat on two years ago on the Lake Coeur d'Alene. You know, I've got, I've got some reason to believe that this will fly like I'm going to show you it might, but I don't know. Uh, I hate to tell you, but there are some airplanes that you don't know about that were failures. And that's why I'm kind of reluctant to talk to, about Ski Goal. But if you don't see it, then you know it didn't fly very well. Okay. Uh, actually, Glenn Smith is going to do the first flight on it, but I'll, I'll do most of the, uh, uh, the ski work myself. Um, uh, the answer to your question is, if you look at my airplanes, my RAF airplanes, except for one of them, I didn't get to enjoy my airplanes like you guys did. I didn't get to enjoy the Very Easy, even though I went to the International Very Easy Hospitality Club people. How many were IVHC people? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, I go to your meetings or whatever, but I didn't get to go that, but you know why? Well, I was building a Defiant or a Quickie, so I didn't have time to enjoy my own airplane. 
when I did the long easy. It went out there and, and hundreds of you, thousands of you guys built, uh, bought plans and hundreds of you flew them in. And there were as many as 100 and, 160 airplanes at one time together right out here at Oshkosh. Maybe 180, I forget what the top number was. You guys got to enjoy them. You guys got to enjoy a home built with 2,000 miles range. You know, some of you ran drugs on them thinking they were invisible. <laughs> There was actually six that I know of, people that thought they wouldn't show up on radar. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and, and so you guys got to do everything with them, but I didn't because I was building the next one. Okay, only one of the RAF airplanes did I get to enjoy myself, and it's the airplane that I have most of my flying time in. I've logged about 2,500 hours, and most of my time has been in the Defiant. Okay, That's, that was a workhorse for me, and I really got to enjoy the Defiant because for many, many years, until I had a boomerang and a catbird, I had this slow, noisy airplane called a Defiant, which was also faster than the Baron, but I still thought it was, after flying the boomerang, it was a slow, noisy airplane. Okay. So, uh, answering your question, I'm going to enjoy this airplane if it flies. In fact, it's designed to be able to do world exploration. Imagine an airplane that's short takeoff and landing on any surface, rough dirt, snow, ice, water, anything, and yet has the range to make it to Hawaii. Imagine an airplane that you can put on, a, on an ocean beach. You can't on any other little seaplane because they disappear in salt water and walk to a service station and buy car gas for it, walk back to the airplane on, with, with a backpacks on your back with 400 miles of fuel. Go back for lunch if you want 780 miles of fuel. You know what I'm saying? Or if you fly over a farmer's field and realize he has a tractor, he's got to have gasoline. I can trade him something for it, so you land in his field and, and get some gas. Now, what I'm talking about is literally something that I have a goal of an airplane that I can ignore airports. For 50 years, starting in 1965, I have worked, excuse me, it isn't 50, since retirement I haven't, but for 46 years, starting in 1965, I have worked on an airport. Initially, flight testing airplanes for the United States Air Force during the Vietnam War. I did that for seven years. And then doing RAF and scale and so on. I always went to the airport to go to work. And I just realized, after sitting up there off of an airport for years in retirement, I don't like airports. <laughs> That's where the FAA is. <laughs> How many of you have ever had a ramp check? How many of you have ever had a ramp check that's not at an airport? <laughs> you have? What was it? I was in a white ship patrol plane and I was in a white ship patrol flight and I was flying around the field and I thought it was pretty and I landed in it and the guy was building a house and he walked over and he seemed to know a lot about airplanes and it turned out he was that day I don't know if you heard that or not, but, but uh, out of this number of people, I've got one guy that was hassled by the FAA, even though he didn't go to an airport. When you're 70 years old, you will take that risk. <laughs> No, I shouldn't be like that. My, I have an airplane that's totally legal, but I, I tell you, I, I think I'm gonna enjoy using car gas or boat gas. Uh, car gas and boat gas doesn't have highway taxes. And I, don't, I found out something just last week, is that while modern cars have had to change their O-rings and their materials and all their engine stuff so that it can live with this god-awful <laughs> ethanol and other crap they put in gasoline, Boat people have not upgraded their engines and stuff to do that. And if you pull up at a dock and get your fuel for a boat, 
I was told by the conical guy right there at, at Harrison on Lake Coeur d'Alene that you are likely to get gasoline and not ethanol because the boat engines don't work with it. And I'm thinking, wow, that's cool. The way to get away from ethanol and toluene and all this stuff. I mean, you go to Brazil, I mean, I, I wanna, I'm gonna explore the Amazon, so I'm gonna find myself in Brazil. Uh, that stuff is like 80% uh, non-gasoline, okay? You know, that, what, what it is, it's, it's stuff that's, that's made from, from uh, food, so they don't mind starving millions in Africa in order to, to give you a more expensive fuel. I can't talk about politics. I can't talk about politics at Oshkosh because there is a risk that there'll be two or three liberals here. And so, um, so anyway, here's the thing. As I understand it, if I go and find a, a, a somebody doing water skiing down there, okay. Um, and land there and go get his gas. It, it'll, it'll likely not be ethanol. It's going to be expensive because it's more expensive to put a service station on a dock and, and have low volume. But what the hell, you're getting good gasoline and you're not having to pay road taxes. Um, I, um, I, I'm looking forward into, into doing a lot of operations, a lot of traveling. Uh, I, I plan to stay in the, uh, in the high pressure systems, the big ones so that I avoid severe weather. And I'm retired, I can go anywhere I want to at any time I want to. And I, I could explore the whole world and stay in a, high, in a big high pressure system, which is, which is kind of cool. Uh, because if you've tied your airplane up to a rock or a tree on a beach somewhere, and it has a stall speed of 40 knots, which means it has a low wing loading, it could get damaged pretty easily by high winds. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I don't know if it'll work, but I, I, I will tell you right now, I don't know whether I'll ever take this Walter Mitty trip that I described on the stuff that I released. But I'll tell you right now, I have been adamant to design this airplane and build it doing nothing that would preclude doing that kind of a trip. Now, I'm probably going to be too old to do it, <laughs> you know. Uh, the neat thing about it is if you have word lens on your iPhone and a couple of other apps, you can talk to anybody in the world, which is kind of cool, right? But I'm probably too old in it, but to answer your question, there may be other people who want an exploration airplane and want to have that kind of unique capability. And uh, I, I, I have been giving all the tooling to Dale Martin of Lewiston. Is Dale here? I know he's at the show. These guys just never want to go to my talks. What the hell? <laughs> <I mean? laughs> he's got all the ski goal uh, tooling, and uh, he's prime and ready to uh, to build parts. And if this airplane flies good, I believe that that it will be marketed in some way. It won't be an LSA. There's no way that you could consider an airplane that only goes 120 knots and only 10,000 feet as an airplane. That's a toy, not an airplane. Uh, next question. Yes, sir. Would you have to release the plans for Boomerang? Ever release oh, plans? plans for Boomerang. <laughs> now you're talking about an airplane that really is hard to build. Uh, uh, talk to Trace. Go down to Boomerang talk to him. That is my most impressive general aviation airplane by a mile. I mean, it's... it's uh, uh, the, the fact that you can take that airplane as a multi-engine airplane at full aft stick, it'll sit in bucking like a long easy, full aft stick, even aft CG, rack it around into a tight turn, feather an engine, go to full throttle on the other one, and it takes a degree and a half of aileron and a pound and a half of aileron to fly it with your feet off the rudder pedal sitting flat on the floor. Now, try that with your duchess or your boot. Uh, no, don't. 
<laughs> I tried that with a beach duchess, and I found out we got full aileron in a bank angle like this, and we got the wives in the back seat, and I turned to Mike Melville and I said, I wonder if Beach ever did this. <laughs> I'm talking about demonstrating min control speed, finding out what your min control speed is, which is defined by if you go a knot slower, you, you will turn and you can't avoid turning. What is your min control speed with your feet on the floor not touching the rudder pedals, okay? And if you do that with a conventional airplane, it's a real scary thing, and the reason we knocked it off real quick is I said, you know, the, the engine that's running is probably about ready to, be, to quit because all the fuel's at the wingtip. So we knocked it off and decided, well, maybe we ought to do this with parachutes instead of wives in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's the boomerang in terms of its safety and flying qualities. Uh, it needs rudder pedals only for taxiing. It needs rudder pedals only for taxiing. And uh, it'll do 260 knots on two four-cylinder uh, um, uh, Lycomings. And it's got a, a maximum range of over 2,400 nautical miles. So that would also be an exploration airplane, except you've got to go to airports. Thank you for reminding me about my favorite airplane, but it's out here. You talked about uh, getting young people into aviation. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. And then second question, my 12-year-old daughter is a reporter for EAA Radio. Would you give her 10 minutes of your time sometime this week to talk? I'll uh, tell you what, EAA has given me a schedule that some of it I need track shoes for. <laughs> but uh, I would tell her to try to catch me after one of the talks. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, most memorable failures. Uh, I'll only say that some of them have been on the kinds of programs that you never hear about because of other reasons. And uh, uh, that's when you're trying to do something that, that's likely impossible. So you, you think you probably are going to fail. And I've been fortunate enough to, to work in an environment really since 1965 when I first worked with the, uh, with the Air Force uh, and hold, holding those kind of clearances. I, I've been fortunate enough to be able to work in that environment, um, which is the most proud work I've done because it's been for my country. But there were a lot of failures, a lot of things that, that didn't work. And again, you're going to have failures if you try hard stuff. If you go out and try to build a, a better seaplane and your goal is to go 12 knots faster, uh, you're probably not going to fail. You may fail because it only goes four knots faster, but it's not going to be a disaster failure. But if you go out and try something that, that is, holy crap, can you really do that? And it fails, uh, it is a failure. Okay. I will tell you that I have shown you all of my RAF airplanes. If you look, look them up, uh, and I have a painting in my house with all 15 of them. One of them was a, was a wing ship done for the Navy, and it was actually tested on Lake Ponderay, which is a 20-minute drive from me now. It's the deepest, quietest lake in, in the country. Uh, but uh, A better answer, 1979, Dick flew in here nonstop in what we called a long easy. I was on his wing in the Defiant. I was filled with, I was filled with passengers, all the luggage and, and stacks of plans, and I was really heavy. And I didn't think I could make it nonstop, uh, so I pushed it up and I landed in Wyoming somewhere and I got gas, took off, climbed back and joined up with Dick. And Mike Melville was here at the show with his very vegan. And he talked the, uh, the uh, air show people to letting him take off between biplane acts. You know what a biplane act is? They've done that here ever since I was here in 71. You got these things with two wings 
and they go up and for eight minutes they go and then they land you know and then they do another one and uh, he took off in his very big and and he flew west and he joined up in a three ship okay Dick was flying in non-stop I made one stop in the Defiant I was in the lead and we came in here and did this beautiful air show with a starburst at the end and whatever. And you got anybody remember seeing that in 1979, okay? I know I got gigged on it because I said I, I flew too low to the ground and almost run Mike Melville into the, into the ground, but he didn't know because he was looking at me. <laughs> uh, that airplane that we brought here in 1979 was a failure. It had a long center section, it had very easy wings that had more sweep, and the faults of the very easy related to its sweep in terms of its stall characteristics and poor lift characteristics, okay? We worked on it with cuffs and bordelons and whatever. That airplane also had a nose rudder and I argued that since the width of it is less than the width between your eyes, that it doesn't get in the way. And I figured that anybody who puts a control surface within eight inches of his feet, that's not gonna be a complicated control system, okay? <laughs> that, by the way, did not destabilize the airplane because it was stable. It, it just turned into the breeze in a side slip and it would give control only if you put a hinge moment on it, in other words, a force on it to provide. Anyway, I kind of liked it because it was simple. <clears throat> but for a number of reasons, that airplane, which was the original prototype Long Easy, was a piece of crap. <laughs> it really was. So after Oshkosh in 1979, we went back to work and we did the Dash 22 version of the Long Easy and 22 was the sweep of the leading edge. And we got the wing a lot straighter, we put a bigger vertical fin on it, and we solved the problem where you could not find Continental engines. You know, they were running out of used O200s, and in those days, nobody would buy a new engine. There were a lot of Lycomings around, ground power units and so on, so I designed it around the 125 horse Lycoming, okay? So I introduced an airplane in 1980 that was, uh, you know, a year after that, that, that was as much bigger than a Very Easy as the Very Easy was from that Volkswagen powered proof of concept thing. And that became uh, my most successful home built from the standpoint of people flying it and I'm very proud of its flying qualities and its safety and so on. And the fact that it has a lot of range has saved a lot of people. And I thought that was really neat. So anyway, it was, it, it was, the, it was uh, essentially from 1980 until we stopped selling plans in 85, it was our, our real product. Let me take somebody in the back. Yes, sir. Oh, thanks. Oh, shoot. Now, you don't have to thank me. There's nothing else to do in Mojave, California. Bert! Bert! Something else. Yeah. Is this Are you going to hang out at Las Cruces? What? Are you going to hang out with all the activity in La Las Cruces? The activity in Las Cruces? I didn't know there was any. Well, the space project. What's in Las Cruces? I thought you guys were working on that space project. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about Upham? Upham, maybe that's... You know where Upham is? Where is that? It's in New Mexico. Yeah. It's not Las Cruces. Oh, you know where Upham is? I thought it was... They had about... Back in the old days. Okay. I'm talking about back when, uh, when we were just discovering the West. You know, sometime between Lewis and Clark and when the gold rush was in California, if you wanted to go from the Albuquerque area north, you had two choices. One, you could go along the river to the west with a high likelihood that you'd be attacked and killed by Indians. 
or two, you could go straight north to Upham across that desert with a strong possibility that you would die of exposure and, 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 and dehydration and starvation, okay? That's what Upham is. And for no reason that I can understand except that the local county taxpayers paid for it, they put a spaceport in Upham, and I have never been there because I think that that is competing with Mojave Spaceport, which is my home. So I've never went to, I, went, I never went to the spaceport in Upham. Is that that's what you're talking yeah, yeah. about? Uh, what's go, tell me what's going on there? I just I'm so and those guys, I thought you were there. There wasn't even a road up there. <laughs> well, I got some information. No, I tell you, I don't know. I, I don't follow the I don't follow the space tourism thing after I retired. So I'm I'm the wrong guy to ask a question about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. To help home builders? I have home builders. I had home builders that I sold very big in plans to in 1974. And I charged them $27 for a set of plans. And 40 years later, I'm helping them build their airplane or fly it. I never believed in charging for builder support. If you charge somebody for builder support, a lot of people won't pay the money and then they'll go out and try it by themselves and may do something wrong. And I've always thought that safety of these things was the most important thing. So we did free support and keep in mind how hard this was in those days. It's hard to believe that there was no internet. <laughs> <laughs> my primarily uh, reach out with information was the Canard Pusher, which was a newsletter that sometimes had 100,000 words in it, and I used font so small because I was too cheap to pay another ounce of postage, <laughs> and everyone had an AD in it that says, don't fly until you fix this. Not formal, FAA didn't enforce it, but I begged people not to fly until you did this. I came to Oshkosh one year with, with a whole pocket full of rice catches. Everybody know what the rice catch is? Anybody know anything at all about a long, easy, or very easy? You know, if you lift the canopy, it's stuck, and you gotta push this thing out of the way to open the canopy, just like the hood of your car. That was named after Harold Rice the first person to get killed in a raft-designed airplane. He was on his first flight, and he hadn't locked his canopy, and it came open, and instead of flying the airplane, he was trying to close it. And he was turned around in his seat, trying to, trying to close his canopy when he hit the ground like this. And we insisted that everybody ground their airplane until they put this safety device in, which is the same thing you find on every car hood. Okay, and I put out a newsletter that says, ground your airplane before you do this, because somebody is gonna take off without locking their canopy. Even though there's a micro switch and a warning and all that other stuff. <coughs> I came to the show at Oshkosh, and I found that about a, a quarter of the airplanes didn't have it. And I walked up to him, and I handed them the part. A piece of stainless steel is flexible and so on. And I says, here, don't go home without this. And that's the way we looked at safety. We wanted to make damn sure that everybody not just was told to do it, but was forced to do it with every, with every power that I had, which is really no power. But I acted like I had some power. <laughs> okay, Tanya is here. Yep. Okay, was Dale, oh, oh, there's, there's Dan, Dan, come on up. You, you were late, uh, yeah, yeah, come on, Dan, I, I've got, a, is Dale Martin here, too? Yeah, Dan, Dan, come on up. When did you guys show up? Oh, sure. There, Dale, Dale, come on up, come on up. Both of you guys. Tanya, come up. I've been talking about, and Tanya, come up. 
Tanya, this group knows. Tanya, how, how many in here, when I ask it, Tanya, come on, how many in here answer the question, yes, that says you have single engine seaplane on your license, but you are not licensed to fly wheels? How many was it? Zero. Zero. Well, now it's one, and it's my wife, Tanya. You're first. Why don't you tell these people about, about flying seaplanes? And after you had a lot of experience flying A-planes, oh, by the way, I told them about your your coast-to-coast -coast duo cross-country already. In the air race, yes, with Pam Bird in a RIN. Um, I got 17 hours of cross-country duel ferrying the airplane from uh, Pennsylvania back to Idaho. She got it back a whole day earlier than it took to get that way in the race. Yeah. Tell, tell them about flying your seaplane. Well, this is, you know, I've flown with Bert for 30 years in the right seat. And our aircraft have always been home built and always very complex, high performance race cars. And, and besides, he, he did every sim everything simply. So instead of having a nice electric switch to put the gear down, you had to grab a bar and twist it and bring it over and down. <laughs> oh, I can't fly that. It wasn't strong enough. That's so why I kept her out of the left seat. <laughs> Just kidding. So when I got the opportunity in Idaho to uh, fly a seaplane, um, and I realized, wow, flying is a lot more... I mean, it can be simple. It doesn't have to be. <laughs> and my, my instructors and my husband um, decided that um, they would have some fun with me um, and that it's very rare to, for a pilot to get their primary license in a, in, um, a single engine C. And they told me, they said, oh, Tanya, it's going to be a lot easier, a lot easier, because, you know, you don't have all the land stuff. But I didn't realize, actually, I had to do all the land flying and all the, you know, far aim uh, And, and the airplane she flew is impossible to land on water with your gear down, which is what hurts most of the guys, because it doesn't have a gear. Yeah, no gear, it's straight floats. Um, but I had to learn land and sea. Uh, it was a lot more difficult on my examiner and my instructors as well. And, but um, I, I found that I had the ability in, to inspire some young women in our area um, to, who were pilots already to go get their seaplane ratings. And um, it took me about a year to get my, my um, primary license in a seaplane, but it took them like three days to get their ratings. So. <laughs> Um, it was, it's, one of these days I'll be able to land on land pretty soon, I hope. Uh, actually, actually, Tanya has soloed uh, several different types of, of airplanes, but she just didn't finish to get her private license in air, air, land airplanes, or what she calls wheels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Dan, come on up here. I love this guy. Uh, here, let me give you the whole history. We moved into a new house and, and we decided that we wanted to be creative and put in our own furniture. So we bought a house that had almost no furniture in it. And I went down to, uh, I bought this big uh, a door off of a temple in India and I mounted it on the wall and I went down to buy some, some, some uh, unusual wood uh, so that I could build some bookshelves. And I thought, well, hell, I'm going to be a woodworking guy. So I got me a saw and a router and all this stuff. And uh, this guy wouldn't let me out of the store without saying, hey, my friend Dan, you ought to have him come over and bid on doing that and, and uh, doing your bookshelves. And I said, well, hell, that's my hobby. I don't, you know, I don't want somebody else to do it. He said, no, this guy's real creative. Why don't you, why don't you at least let him bid on it? So I did. And he walked into my bedroom and looked around and he looked at the fireplace and he looked around and he says, I got it. 
I can put it in on on on. Uh, I'll do the I'll do the brickwork in two days, and I'll finish the job on Monday. This was Thursday, and I'm thinking, wow, uh, he must have nothing else to do. <laughs> and Monday Maybe. we had the most beautiful installation in our bedroom. You can't believe. I mean, it's just it was. Just, it's hard to describe. It had all these touch lights, and it had. I mean, it was just absolutely gorgeous. By the way, he's not just a woodworker. He has a, an outfit called. Uh, artisan CDA. CDA is is not what the Canadians think about our city. CDA. Uh, CDA means Coeur d'Alene, and we call it CDA because Coeur d'Alene is too hard to spell. But anyway, uh, ever since then, we'd have Dan come in and say, "Hey, we how about making a library out of this room?" And you got to see how beautiful it is. So I worked with Dan for a whole year. And, and we, we, one room at a time, we have some just beautiful custom stuff in there, all designed and built in his one-man shop up, at, uh, up north in Athol. Athol. Uh, anyway, we became good friends. And when it, when it really came down to the wire and I said, I gotta get this airplane to Oshkosh and I don't think I can do it alone, I know how fast he works. In fact, he built the basic structure for the hydro test article at full d uh, scale. He did it in two days, and you'll see, you'll see pictures. Actually, it was one day I delivered. It yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got me. But anyway, I thought of Dan, and I says, you know, I'm going to hire him, and we're going to work together. And he works so fast that I think we can get his airplane to Oshkosh. And we joined forces then in my garage. By the way, my first airplane was built in a garage, a very big one. Every other one was built in an airport shop. And this last one was built in a garage. Uh, so I had a four car garage and one at a time we kicked our two cars out of the garage. You know? <laughs> but anyway, Dan and I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we worked some hours that are just unbelievable and we I'll tell you, we left our carbon footprint like you wouldn't believe. I got a picture of it, because when I moved my old belt, uh, bandsaw, there was so much carbon fiber dust on it that I put my foot down like this, and I moved it around, and I moved my foot back, and Dan took a picture of it. That's Bert Rutan's carbon footprint. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, we had a lot of fun. Uh, when Hollywood would show up, these guys, They'd turn our country music off because they didn't want to pay the, uh, the fees for it showing up in there. And so we, we, we treated them like Hollywood people, but we actually get along with them. And, uh, uh, but anyway, we worked together like you would not believe. I'm talking about we worked ourselves beyond exhaustion. And like I described all this before you showed up and whatever. But uh, the fact that we just flat collapsed when we decided we couldn't make Oshkosh. But Dan, I, I really wanted him to see what he would have seen if we got Ski Goal here. So we got him a seat in the Starship, and he and his son Kyle, hi Kyle, uh, came with us in the Starship. And uh, this is the first time he's been to, to uh, an air show. He's a radio control guy, but he's not a pilot, so we're probably going to change that too. But anyway, Dan, I want you to, I want you to tell this people and I, I'm willing to take any kind of hits, you know, I'm pretty durable. But tell these people what it was like working with Bert Rutan trying to build a very complicated airplane. Well, the one thing I can tell you about Bert Rutan is he's the most dedicated man you could ever work with. I, he, it was 24-7 Skeagol. And trying to get this guy, I would look at him in the shop doing a layup and I'd look over and I'd go, Bert. Your eyes look like two piss holes in a snowbank. Go take a nap. <laughs> and so he'd finally go, okay. And he'd go in the house, he'd come back out an hour later and just, yeehaw, I'm ready to go. <laughs> but yeah, he is just so dedicated. It's just unbelievable. And you know, I've been told I have a good worth ethic, but it's nothing like Bert's. And I strive to be more like Bert and work harder. <laughs> But it, it was a lot of fun. He's got some really good jokes that you, you'll hear more than once during the build of an airplane. <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell them all at Oshkosh. Yeah. Yeah. I sure you can. They're not that bad. Well, that's right. I'm 72. I don't give a you shit can. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we'll, uh, 
uh, I'm sure I'll still be working on it and we'll get it done and it'll be here next year and it'll be fun. Yep. And, uh, you know, when somebody, when somebody puts that kind of dedication and work alongside of you, you owe them a lot. You really do. And I'm looking forward to taking some, some ski goal exploration trips. Stuff that maybe Tanya doesn't want to go on, and and we'll we'll go we'll go visit some cool places, and like I said, I'm going to enjoy this airplane. Uh, and uh, uh, now the other to the other question of will this airplane be uh, be marketed? Uh, I I mentioned that we got to see if it flies first, and I talked about Dale Martin who now has all of the tooling for the airplane. Dale, come on up. Okay, Dale Martin, uh, he is, uh, what, can you describe the, the, the work you normally do? Or, or describe anything you want to, you're, you're, introduce yourself to this crowd. Hi, uh, what I do is uh, mostly you gotta put that work, 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 work. Um, and mostly on composite canard aircraft, yeah, I like them. Um, I also help a lot of people with their metal airplanes and uh, engine problems and whatnot uh, they go on. Uh, and that's kind of my business, this uh, Owl Eagle. You can look it up at long-easy.com. That was given to me by Ken Miller. I know he's not here, but uh, Ken's a great guy on the East Coast. Uh, I text him on the East Coast, no less. And I also uh, contract uh, to Gary Hertzler uh, for uh, making uh, uh, his uh, propellers, the silver bullets. Not all of them. Gary gets to do some, I get to do some. So that's a good sideline. It uh, teaches you perfection. Gary is a one heck of a uh, builder and he's a great engineer besides and a good friend. So. Knowing that I would be too old to do it, <laughs> I got with Dale, who's who's a neighbor of mine. It's a two hour drive south in, uh, in Lewiston, yeah, not Idaho. Livingston, right? Yeah, not, not, not Livingston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> by the only, the only trip that I took out of town during this during this time was to go to his his birthday party down in Lewiston. But anyway, um, I uh, I told Dale I says, listen, if anything ever gets done with this thing, um, uh, somebody's going to need the tooling, and is going to need to improve the tooling and so on. Would you mind collecting it on the thought that maybe if there's a kit program or something down the road that you might want to have the tooling and and actually build these parts. You're going to see a pretty phenomenal composite part called a main integrated bulkhead, and it'll be on my talk tomorrow at 1 in Forum 7. And you're going to see that part, and you're going to understand why it's important that a home builder be able to get a hold of that part. It helps him jig his whole airplane, and it needs to be built in tooling. It's not something that he can build himself. Uh, well, he can. He can do it like I did. but. But anyway, I started getting Dale all the tooling. And then he'd show up, and he and his wife would help me do layups. They laid up the, uh, uh, the vertical fin. And, and, uh, and I thought, you know, I, I don't want to do the boring work. So after I built these real neat wing spars for Ski Goal by a new method, and I'll show you that tomorrow, I said, well, now I've got to cut cores and put them on and skin them. Now I'm doing exactly the same kind of work as building a long, easy wing. And I thought... <laughs> Let's have somebody else do that. So I, I, Dale came and picked up the spars and some drawings, and uh, he came back and delivered the wings. So Dale has built the flap. Uh, I believe this is the only airplane that has only one flap. You don't put the flaps down, you put the flap down. Um, um, he's, uh, he built the flap, he built the outboard wings, I built the inboard wing. He built the um, uh, ailerons and horizontal tail. So uh, Dale has helped build this airplane. He's done his work at home down in Lewiston. And every time he brings to deliver a new part for the Ski Goal, he goes back loaded with all the tooling and he's storing it now in hopes that this airplane actually will fly someday. <laughs> and if it does, it'll, it'll be something that, that this tooling is, re, is, is uh, taken care of 
and that there'll be someone who can produce these parts. Okay, I am told about seven minutes ago that someone else is in here in 15 minutes, so we got about eight uh, in which... Let me take two more questions in eight minutes. What? Uh, I'll describe all the details on Skego tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. My favorite airplane, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, I used to always say, the next one, the, the next one, right? Uh, after Spaceship One, I always said Spaceship One. Because I didn't think in my career I would have the opportunity to do s something as significant as that in my little shop. And ever since 2004, when that flew to space, I would always say my favorite air of all my designs is Spaceship One. Uh, however, if Skeagol actually does everything that it was designed to do, I may reconsider that. Don't know. Yes, sir. <coughs> Whatever happened to Bipod? I talked scaled into doing the first phase of the program uh, before I retired, and that was involving the hard stuff to calculate. In other words, would Bipod um, would bipod uh, handle uh, crosswinds at 80 miles an hour on a freeway? Would it do okay if a, if a big truck passed it? You know, because it's pretty light and it's carrying the wings in between. Can it really live on freeway traffic and highway traffic? Can it go over rough roads? How is it on a skid pad for tight turns? So I talked scaled into letting me do just that part of it. We didn't even build the propellers electric propellers, and we didn't put in the gas generator, which makes the, the actually Brent Reagan, who did, who's doing the docking system for, for uh, uh, Skeagol, he built the battery system and, and the electric propulsion system for Bipod. And, and uh, you'll, you'll meet him uh, tomorrow. Um, at any rate, I realized that I was only going to get to drive this thing before I retire. And, you know, hopefully Scale will move on and do a flying car, okay, which is a hard thing to do. In fact, Dano, who came up here as an RC guy, a lot of people think that bipod means that it's a two-pod airplane. You know, you sit in the left side with a steering wheel to drive it, and you sit in the right side with a side stick and rudder pedals to fly it. So it's two pods. Wrong. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, Doug Shane named it, and he always does these acronyms. Dan, how long have you been working trying to build a flying car? 25 years. He is the Molt Taylor of this century because he's been working 25 years to develop a flying car. So anyway, Dan, or, or Doug Shane, looked at that, and we were looking for a name for this thing, and he says, I got it. Bert's innovative project overtakes Dano. <laughs> and that's what Bipod is named after. Uh, okay, bottom line, I realized, well, wait a minute, let's build the wings before I retire because I can ground launch it with, with the wheels. If I can drive to 85 miles an hour and the stall speed is, is, is 43, we can fly it. So we did. We went off in the corner, we built the wings and the ailerons. Okay? And we put all this together and it was a it was a almost a ski goal like sort of thing. Now, the last four months that I worked at scale, I worked about seventy or eighty hours a week. And the day before I retired, Bipod went out to the runway, raced down there uh, to eighty, lifted off, and flew down the runway. Now, you get no thrust once you lift off if you're only using wheel power, right? So you got no chance of doing a go around. <laughs> but at least we got to fly it before I retired. Now, what did Scale do with it after that? I haven't been watching it. Uh, Dan, what, what has Scale done with Bipod after I retired? Yeah. I think what happened is a couple of things. They put it in storage and to bring it out on, on family day. But 
Uh, the basic reason, the basic thing, is scale got real, real busy. I don't know whether you guys know it or not. How many here work for Boeing? Uh, did anybody work at, up where they make 747s? How many of you are aware that Scale right now is building an airplane bigger than the Airbus 380, the world's largest airplane? Okay. 385 foot wingspan. That's a pretty good project for Scale to do, right? We had to build a hangar so we could open the door and roll it out. That hangar is the world's widest door. What? There's two of, of, of the straddle launch engineers right here. I would ask them to come up here and describe it, but the customer has sworn them to secrecy. But you can look real carefully on the web and you can actually see some clips taken from a local reporter's video and you can see this airplane. And the, the very best shop tour in the world for aerospace right now is the straddle launch hangar in in uh, in Mojave where they're building the world's largest airplane however they don't give shop tours <laughs> another little anecdote about about straddle launch uh, they named it rock ROC but they didn't tell me uh, you know it's just the in-house name they didn't tell me what that meant I found out later that it's a, it's a mytho mythological bird that's so big it can carry elephants, okay? So that's what rock ROC means. And I'm trying to figure out what the hell rock means. And for 20 some years, I had done preliminary designs of this world's largest airplane. And we never had a customer, we never had, it never went beyond that. And I thought it never would be. After I retired, they rounded up a customer and they're building it now. Okay, but ROC, I thought it meant because my own people thought I was crazy trying to have a little company build an airplane bigger than Airbus and Boeing. And so I, I figured out myself that rock meant rutans on crack. Uh, I, I think you're going to fly it in a couple of years, something like that. Uh, you're gonna see it once it goes outside. It's really hard to hide something that big. <laughs> but you're gonna see an airplane that can launch a booster, a rocket booster that's normally launched vertical, that can put, that can put four to six people in orbit, and they can do it right out of Mojave Airport, and that's really cool. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you. And uh, again, I'll be, I will be talking, I'll be talking next. I'll be talking next at 1 o'clock in an interview on Aeroshell Square. And then after that, uh, 8 o'clock tonight in uh, Theater in the Woods. Thanks.